Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to Stronger Together, Multi-Stakeholder Voices in Cyber Diplomacy. Um, thanks so much for, for being here. Thanks so much to IGF for providing us this space. Um, and to those of you who are sort of combating various forms of either jet lag or just sort of post-lunch afternoon fatigue, really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to be part of what's a pretty important discussion. Uh, my name is John Herring. I'm a Senior Government Affairs Manager from Microsoft, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we have an incredible panel, both online uh, and on stage here, and I'll have them introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, but I wanted to start with just providing some framing remarks around uh, the, the issue at hand um, to bring folks up to, to speed on, on what we'll be diving into, um, which is the nature of multi-stakeholder inclusion in UN cybersecurity dialogues in particular, uh, and the need for having those voices in those dialogues. Uh, Actually, this is a well-timed conversation because last week Microsoft released its annual digital defense report, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to dive into in the days since it's come out, I would encourage you to do so. It's our summative annual threat um, intelligence report that we put out, uh, providing a comprehensive overview of how Microsoft sees uh, the threat landscape. It's not necessarily the entire landscape. We only see our sliver of the internet on our platforms, but it does give uh, a pretty illustrative view of what the contemporary challenges are. Uh, and unsurprisingly, cybercrime continues to be an increasing challenge. Um, in particular, we've noticed over the past year, it's increasingly professionalized. Uh, that's to improve the, the scale and then the impact of, of cybercrime um, operations. And then when it comes to nation state activities as well, we've seen uh, continued escalations in that space, in particular with a focus on espionage operations over the past year. Um, and 41% of which, in terms of all of nation state uh, cyber operations observed by Microsoft uh, threatened uh, intelligence teams uh, were focused on critical infrastructure sectors uh, across various uh, regions of the globe. None of this is especially new. Uh, it's been an escalating concern for decades. Um, but now the integration, obviously, of cyber operations in armed conflict is becoming a rising concern, including uh, in the past year and a half in Ukraine, most notably, which is making conversations around peace and security online, in particular at the UN, all the more urgent. Um, we have seen over the same time period of the last few decades um, also the UN stepping up to try and meet the moment and keep pace uh, with an evolving uh, threat environment. Uh, stirring up various working groups and new processes, evolving its mandate to make sure it's meeting the moment. Um, and this has also introduced a new challenge in how do we include the right multi-stakeholder voices in those conversations. Cyberspace is, after all, a much more shared domain of conflict than perhaps any other, given that it's inherently synthetic and a lot of it owned and operated by private entities. It also raises important questions about how to ensure the right human rights are protected um, and the necessary multi-stakeholder and academia voices are at the table as well. Uh, and thus far, we've seen sort of an ad hoc patchwork approach to trying to include more multi-stakeholder voices in those conversations. So that brings us to today and I think a twofold goal for this conversation. Uh, the one, on the one hand, it's to hopefully keep everyone appropriately informed on where these conversations are at the United Nations and beyond, and to hopefully help people feel like they are equipped to more effectively engage in those conversations. And then two is going to be to hear from you in the room, from those in the IGF community, um, about the challenges, recommendations, or guidance you might have around how we might improve the relevant inclusion of multi-stakeholder voices in cybersecurity dialogues. Um, that will be essential, I think, both for our guests on the stage as well for an after-action report that we'll put together following this session. Um, so to that end, we will save the bulk of the time of this session towards the end for audience Q&A. Uh, and that's not just question and answer, but also commentary, uh, other suggestions, or things you'd like to contribute to this conversation um, or that you'd like to hear our, our guests uh, respond to. Um, but without further ado, then, I'd like to welcome our speakers uh, first on the stage uh, and then Charlotte online to just introduce themselves first, um, let us know who you are, what organization you're from, and maybe your relation to the cybersecurity dialogues at the UN. Maybe start at the end of the table and come on down. Now working. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for having me on, on this uh, prestigious panel. Uh, my name is Marie Mo. I'm working at the uh, permanent um, uh, mission uh, of the Netherlands to the UN in Geneva. And uh, I'm first secretary cyber, so I'm the incarnation of what cyber diplomacy is from a member state's perspective. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, I'm Pablo Castro, I'm cybersecurity coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile. 
I basically cover cybersecurity, cybercrime, now I'm covering uh, AI in the military domain, and among other cyber things, you know. That's basically my, my role in the ministry. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joyce Hackme. I'm the deputy director of the International Security Program at Chatham House. My relationship to this conversation today is that my team, we lead a lot of or a number of projects following UN cyber processes, uh, the open-ended working group, as well as the Cybercrime Convention. And we have had our fair share of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement or attempt to do so at the UN. Thank you so much, Bert Teuermann, Austrian Cyber Ambassador, um, leading Austria's delegation both to the Open Ed Working Group on Cybersecurity and the Ad Hoc Committee on the Cybercrime Treaty. Thank you. Thank you. And Charlotte, if you're online, could you try and uh, introduce yourself as well? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. So my name is Charlotte Lindsay. I'm the Chief Public Policy Officer at the Cyber Peace Institute in Geneva. Uh, and with my team, we uh, engage in the, the UN processes, the Open-Ended Working Group, uh, the Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime, uh, and, and other fora in order to try to um, bring evidence and data-driven based analyses of cyber um, in landscape. Thanks so much, uh, and thank you again to our panelists for, for joining us. Starting on kind of the government side of this equation, I just kind of gave a, a little bit of an outline from how we see the, the threat environment from the industry side, but let me hear maybe from Marie and, and Bert to start us off. How has the conversation around nation state activity in particular uh, evolved at the UN um, in the time that you've had there? Uh, and where are we living up to, uh, and where are we falling short of the international expectations that have been set? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, from a really UN perspective and really focusing on the cyber in the strict sense, which is cybersecurity, um, I think those discussions are not really new. They've been going on for since 1998. Um, but um, but the, there is also a broader picture that we need to take into consideration because um, the, the cybersecurity discussion are not new, but what is new is first the scale at which they are being discussed. So it's in more and more places, but also the integration of other stakeholders that is pretty new into those processes. Um, when actually we've seen on the what we would look at the broader cyber picture, more multi-stakeholder engagement, and that comes back to the 2003 with 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 this. Um, but. The, the fact that in the cybersecurity strict sense of the discussion, we've seen um, stronger multi-stakeholder involvement, unfortunately does not have yet achieved the, 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 um, the inclusivity that we had expected in the first place. And uh, we would like to have more inclusivity. Um, it's already nice that the open-ended working group now is open to all member states which was not the case with the GGE. So we, there is already more inclusivity, but I think we would like to go a bit further and to make sure that all relevant stakeholders can have their voice heard also in those discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, from my perspective, I have to say I'm very much looking forward to the discussion here because what I can observe is of course a quite a discrepancy between the way uh, we discuss things here at the IGF and where everyone is on an equal footing. And as soon as, if you stay with the metaphor, step your foot into the UN, it becomes very intergovernmental. And by its very nature, it's not very multi-stakeholder friendly. So we always see that it's really an uphill battle uh, every time uh, in all these processes. Um, and when it comes to, to your specific question on, on sort of the, the threat landscape and how it is being discussed, also there, there's a bit of a discrepancy between the real world and the UN world. Uh, in the real world, you described yourself. Uh, you just released your own um, uh, annual report, which lays out the landscape that is very, uh, uh, which raises many concerns about state actors, non-state actors, the collusion between the two, or cybercrime activities by state actors, etc., espionage activities, how it's combined, how cyber act, malicious cyber actors become more and more involved in disinformation, uh, information campaigns, all this is there. But it's very 
difficult, if not impossible, to have a frank discussion on this in the Open Networking Group when we discuss threats. There's always the, there's, there's a strong sense, it's an uncomfortable discussion, so to say, and, and people rather s skim over. There's a stronger interest to discuss things like confidence building, etc., than to discuss the hard stuff. Why do we need to build confidence? Because there is a problem of, uh, of growth in, in malicious cyber activities. For, particularly when it comes, for instance, to, to the issue of cyber espionage, we are therefore, for instance, of the view that we should become much clearer in calling it out as clear violations of the normative framework um, when such activities are directed against states or critical infrastructure, etc. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, sticking sort of on the, the government side of, of this conversation, and, and we'll go right back to you, actually, Bert. Um, and then bring Pablo into the conversation as well. You guys have both mentioned, I think, now the open-ended working group, which is the current uh, information security dialogue, the second iteration of that body. Pre previous to that, it was the group of governmental experts, and there were successive rounds of that. Um, I think as of 2015, there have been established norms for you know responsible state behavior online, some recognition that international law ought to govern um, also state behavior online. There has not been new norms established since that period of time, um, and I, I was wondering if you could just sort of shed some light on how should we think of the current status of the uh, open-ended working group? What is its mandate and mission? And then what is the importance of multi-stakeholder inclusion in that? Thank you. Um, well, regarding norms, and especially new norms, I have to be really honest that maybe even from the perspective of Chile, we're not really thinking probably in new norms. It's more like the implementation of 11 norms, especially the regional level, is probably one of the, our main interests right now. And I would say this is also very important for the, uh, our Latin American regions, you know, to try to move forward in this, you know. Not some, all this, expectation could be different, you know, regarding the open and the working groups. And, and, and from Latin America and from our conversation with our colleagues, I would just say right now we have a good coordination with other states, you know, after years that probably, uh, uh, stayed uh, a minister for foreign affairs. They didn't have, you know, someone in charge of cyber. Now it's possible to do this sort of coordinations. Um, capacity building, for example, is very important. But when it comes to norms, I think implementation is something important, especially at the regional level. And that could be also a good chance for um, uh, stakeholders, you know, how they can help this process, you know, stage, you know, and improve this implementation. It's one of the reasons why uh, last year which has proposed a new CBMs. You know, there's a working group at the OIS uh, for the establishment of um, CBMs in cyberspace that started back in 2017. We have now 11, 11 CBMs, which is quite something. One of them, it's uh, about the strength implementation of, of, of 11 norms, you know. And that was proposed specifically to try to, you know, encourage a state to work more than this. With the assistance of the uh, uh, organization of American State, the cybersecurity program is very good, very important in this process, and be working, you know, a lot with stakeholders. So I think that it could be a good opportunity, you know, to that stakeholder can help the stadium and to move on this. Now, moving forward, the open and the working group is a is a top, it's a really good question, you know, because as we have different expectation, by the way, for, for Latin America, for example, capacity building could be probably something really important. We managed in the last, I mean, in July to made a joint statement, you know, several, I mean, uh, state from Latin America about capacity building. And as, and the current situation now, I think, is a little bit complicated. We always have this conversation between the states in our region because uh, try to get the consensus, the open and the working groups, it's really difficult. And uh, so trying to, you know, to decide which are the subject, the item you want to really move on, it's also very complicated. So it's a complicated balance, you know. As, so far, I think we've been trying, you know, to agree on things that we think that everyone could agree, whether CBMs, you know, directory portal. And, um, but I cannot really oversee how we can really move on on new topics and new discussion. We can do that. That's because, of course, the current context of the complicated conversation we have. And I don't see that's going to be easy to resolve in, a, in, a, in coming years. I mean, I mean, according to the geopolitical situation we have right now. Thank you. Thanks so much. I can subscribe to everything Pablo said. And just to add, our sense is also we need to focus on how we implement better, or, and even not only implement, understand better the normative framework as we have it. We also see quite some, there are some countries out there who try to make, to produce confusion. They say, oh, we only have voluntary norms. We have, uh, therefore, we need a legally binding treaty to clarify what the legal obligations are. 
ignoring the fact that we have, the General Assembly has repeatedly confirmed that, the, that international law as enshrined in the Charter, etc., fully applies. Therefore, we need to have more dedicated discussions to s in look specifically what does it mean international law applies. So since we are just finalizing our national position paper where we try to hammer this out, and we are very happy with lobbying this for a while, that next year one of the intersessional, intersessional sessions of the Open Networking Group will be dedicated to the question of application of international law. And, and as we see, need to see, it's, it's, it's a bit, the voluntary norms are a bit muddied the waters almost. It leads to some confusion. We also will have more discussions on the voluntary norms. So in our view, again, we don't need new norms. We need better understanding of the existing ones, what exactly that means. But then, of course, particularly that they have been implemented and the countries who violate them are held accountable. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I heard accountability, uh, confidence building measures, um, <coughs> clarifying the, the existing norms obligations, all the spaces where um, we can move forward uh, within the context of the current open ended working group and future cybersecurity dialogues and things which need multi stakeholder inclusion and participation and engagement. And so to that side, I wanted to bring in uh, Charlotte online and, and, and Joyce from the sort of non governmental stakeholder perspective. Could you just take us through, I think, first for, you know, I think we have a lot of government folks in the room. What is it like to try and uh, participate and, and engage in the UN uh, information security dialogues as a non governmental stakeholder? Thanks, John. Um, and very, very good question. Um, I think this is something that um, sort of like uh, an experience that we reflect on quite a lot and we sort of share stories, the multi-stakeholder community between each other. I think uh, speaking from our experience at Chatham House, but also observing multi-stakeholder participation more generally, um, I think there are so maybe four issues that I believe act as a challenge to the multi-stakeholder participation. And of course, you know, I'm not gonna talk about the biggest one, which is states blocking, actively going out of their way sometimes to blocking uh, multi-stakeholders participation in UN processes. Uh, the first point I wanna make is, I guess, uh, there is um, a, a disbelief or perhaps insufficient conviction from some states about the value that multi-stakeholders bring to the table. And so you basically, and, and, and this comes often from states who arguably need this support or could benefit from this uh, support the most. So often the starting point is really sort of making the case about why it is important that you're at the table and what is it that you can contribute. And so this basically leads to either states in not engaging with multi-stakeholders or so if they tolerate your pre presence, you know, they don't engage or they engage at the, at the superficial level. And perhaps this stems from the second point I want to make, which is uh, a perception that some uh, states have that the multi-stakeholder community is a, is a sort of a, a uniform group, it's a, like monolith, and we sort of all have the same agenda, the same approach, the same objectives. Um, and this is obviously more true when it comes to civil society rather than in, uh, to industry. But of course that's not true, right? Because civil society is a very diverse group uh, with, um, you know, sometimes overlapping, but more complementary mandates and the role that they can play is diverse. So if you don't understand what they can bring to the table, then it is hard to sort of engage with them properly. Um, the third issue is, um, and this is more sort of directed at countries who actually support the multi-stakeholder participation and can be called the champions of multi-stakeholder uh, uh, participation, who really kind of like make that point over and over again in UN processes and, and beyond. I think sometimes the challenge with that relationship is there is a lack of strategic but also consistent engagement. Um, and, 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 you know, this could be uh, related to like time issues, resources issues, or perhaps sometimes lack of coordination within the government itself between the different agencies. So this means that, you know, the relationship with uh, multi-stakeholders isn't as good as it can be, isn't as impactful as it can be. Now, um, I'm not suggesting that this is just the um, responsibility of government. I think, of course, this is a shared responsibility. It's a relationship, so it has to go uh, both ways. And perhaps, um, you know, on the on the, this current OEWG specifically, I think the uh, probably the sort of the word that describes it the best when it comes to multi-stakeholder participation is uncertainty. 
right? With every session, like multi-stakeholder groups, they don't know whether they're going to be accredited or not. I know Microsoft, you've had your good chair uh, in, in, in that, and, and so did Chatham House, until we finally got the ECOSOC status, which in a way kind of like, you know, gave us that, that right to be in the room. And, you know, uh, the ability to influence UN processes, like in this kind of very complex geopolitical climate that, that Pablo described, requires strategic planning over time. So if you're un uncertain whether you're going to be in the room or not, it makes it very hard to actually influence. Um, I want to also talk about these sort of other ways where you can influence, but maybe for, for later. Uh, but maybe I want to conclude with this point that um, although this, you know, the, the, the participation hasn't been great, it has been possible, right? And I think from our perspective, it, is, it has been a learning curve. Um, and particularly, for example, if we look at the Cybercrime Convention, this is the first time the multi-stakeholder community is trying to shape a legal instrument within the UN on cyber, right? And so we are learning a lot of lessons that will definitely help us in the future and also help us sharpen our tools. And Charlotte, you're up if you're online. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, I agree with uh, the points that Joyce raised. I would just like to focus on uh, on a couple of points. I think that um, while the open-ended working group is officially open to stakeholders, states have this veto power, which Joyce uh, mentioned, which limits the participation and dozens of organizations, including the Cyber Peace Institute, are um, regularly vetoed. And I think that that makes it very complicated for us to plan strategically, but also to really be representative um, and to bring uh, added value to these uh, to this fora. I mean, clearly an achievement what has been that the GGE and the Open Ended Working Group ran these sort of parallel processes and came out with a, with a consensus report, which was aligned. However, it's very complicated for the, in these parallel processes for multi-stakeholder civil society organizations to be able to participate in all of these parallel processes and to really be able to contribute. Um, the Cyber Peace Institute, we have been able to contribute to the objectives of several of the UN working groups. Um, we've submitted comments, recommendations on pre-drafts, on zero drafts, on final reports of the Open Ended Working Group. Um, we have also submitted um, um, multi-stakeholder engagement statement, um, which we led with a, a group of other organizations and contributed ahead of substantive sessions. So we are able to, to find ways to contribute, but it does take um, a, a lot of navigation, a lot of engagement behind the scenes to be able to, to really uh, be able to be present and to put statements and positions forward. Um, I think that you know, we, as civil society organizations, we do have added value that we can bring. And I think that what we have been able to demonstrate and many states uh, demonstrate that they, um, that they really appreciate these contributions is bringing data and evidence um, on many of the issues that are being addressed in the open-ended working group. Um, and we have been able to, for example, bring things like a compendium of best practices on protecting the healthcare sector um, from cyber harm and bring practical recommendations that can really help negotiations and help discussions. Um, and I think that the, when, by bringing these recommendations, we can add the diversity, we can bring voices um, which really represent the full range of how the um, uh, cyber landscape is actually being managed and the threats on that of that um, in that landscape today. Uh, I would just like to make a couple of, of final points. I think while we see that a number of governments have really sort of reiterated their commitment towards an inclusive process in, in which the multi-stakeholder community really does have a voice, we think it really is important that there's more clarity on what these co potential contributions from uh, civil society or non uh, multi-stakeholders can really bring, and this can encourage other states to really advocate for and pursue this more inclusive process. If there is an understanding of the added value, then each time each organization is not having to bring that. Um, and we think also what is complex ahead of some of the sort of consultative meetings, um, we think it's also very complex when documents aren't shared ahead of meetings or are very late and therefore it's really hard to bring, as Joyce mentioned, this very strategic um, role 
if we're not able to actually um, receive any of the documents, understand what the subjects are going to be, and then are also not necessarily able to participate in the room. So we think it would be important to have real clarity on non-state actors and how they can participate in the substantive sessions, clarity on the level of transparency and transparency and visibility offered for multi-stakeholder contributions throughout the process. Um, and we think that there also needs to be inclusion, not just at sort of, of international organizations and civil society organizations operating at an international level, but also those operating nationally and regionally. Mm -hmm. And this could also help have a more of a global understanding um, of the, the challenges, but also the contributions that different actors can play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, and, and, and just this, um, I think hit all the, the major points in terms of you know, as a non-governmental stakeholder who has also tried to engage in these processes before, uh, I think covered pretty well what some of those challenges have been. But I do think, to your point, Joyce, uh, this is also a, a learning process. And I, and I think we should also give credit where credit is due. I remember, you know, the first ever multi-stakeholder consultation for the OEWG that happened, you know, in the room, conference room B at the, at the UN in 2019. And we really have come a long way since then in, in terms of regularizing things and having much greater inclusion. That's a credit to, um, I think, a lot of support from various member states, increasingly increasing numbers of member states. Um, and then also the current chair of the OEWG, who I think we should um, recognize as well as, as having worked to, to create regularized, um, at least intersessional consultations with non-governmental stakeholders. Um, but I think to the broader point here, indeed, it has been highly ad hoc. And especially for resource limited organizations, that's a particular challenge to try and think about how best to structure um, that level of engagement. So then thinking about maybe the other uh, moving forward and how, how to sort of uh, begin to be a little more accommodating and inclusive, um, I'd love to hear from uh, Bert and, uh, um, and from, from Charlotte. Um, oh, I'm one ahead. Um, Thinking beyond sort of just the OEWG and the GGE, Pablo and Marie, um, I'd love to hear sort of just a comparison to other first committee processes um, that maybe have greater uh, success with multi-stakeholder inclusion, uh, whether that's you know the ECOSOC status or, or any other ways that we've seen um, other stakeholders more successfully included um, in, in the past. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, well, I mean. Uh, this is mentioned, I mean, the, the, the cyber crime, you know, um, current process right now, uh, we do have this modality where we agree, it was working pretty well. Uh, we can mention also, I mean, all the discussion, like, for example, we're talking about weapon systems um, and, and in Geneva. And, but I, when I also think about the future dialogues, future process, okay, I have to think about the program of action, which is something that's coming. It's gonna be a very good opportunity, you know, to really, create a sort of, uh, as you mentioned, and I'm gonna really love the word strategy, is something we definitely need. And in a way also tries to create some, or define a specific role for multi stakeholder, let's say in the future BOA, you know, how they can help, you know, or assist in terms of um, identifying needs, assessment, how to help a state for the implementations. We can in some way our Creates not to say in a structure, but define some roles in this future dialogue. I mean, that way our, uh, we can I mean uh, identify some stakeholders that are good for some. Let's say international law. Let's say eleven norms. Let's say CBMs, or in that way, I think it, it could be good if we can actually try to start this discussion. You know, I think uh, well, Cyberspace Institute, for example, has been a very good. I mean, uh, report on this uh, at the website. Because this is just something that is coming, in, I mean, uh, sooner in the next couple of years. And uh, that could be a good opportunity for a state, I mean, to think about this. Now, I would like to see also more, I mean, uh, probably partnerships between a stakeholder and, and, and other states. It's something that maybe in Latin America, even from Chile, I would like to do more on this in some, as I said before, in this specific task. Uh, this is something I could, we could probably mean start to think and work in the uh, I would say near future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I will just go a bit further than just the uh, UN and the first committee. Um, but looking at uh, uh, first at a purely like UN perspective, I think those discussions we've seen popping in into so many different fora. When the pandemic started, 
where WHO started talking about cybersecurity. We were seeing cybersecurity related discussion in the context of, of e commerce, but also obviously with uh, the ongoing situation in Europe and in Ukraine in the humanitarian dialogue. Um, so I think we also need to take this into consideration and how other stakeholders are involved into, uh, into those discussions. Because if, if we don't connect um, the dots and all those discussions as well, then we will never be able to have the open, free and secure environment that, that we want and where people trust, that people trust and that we can all benefit from. So that's on a positive note. Um, but we are also seeing a, a, a growing number of multi-stakeholder initiative outside of the UN, be it at the, at the national, regional, international level. And those are really inspiring. And I think we need to look at how stakeholders, when they are having those multi-stakeholder initiative, how they engage with each other. Um, it's, I found it difficult to, to really compare because obviously we are in a UN situation or in a, in a multi-stakeholder. But I think we need to look for inspiration wherever we can and not only in first committee or uh, purely UN, because as was pointed out, it's really new to have multi-stakeholder engagement within first committee discussion in, on cyber. So um, I think um, uh, that's, that's one of the things. The other thing that was mentioned a bit earlier on the panel is it's true that we don't always really well understand as diplomats the entire uh, breadth of how much civil society can bring and the stakeholders. And one of the things I would like to point out is in the context of the open-ended working group, we never mentioned the technical community. If you look at the report, we talk about civil society, the private sector, academia, but the technical community, for example, is, is not there. So I think that's also a sign that we need to continue that dialogue and we need to understand how much other stakeholders can bring to those discussions. And then little by little, I think we will make uh, that space and, uh, and that we will hopefully see more participation in, in those discussions. Thank you both. And uh, Pablo, I think you uh, mentioned the elephant in the room here, perhaps, uh, in these conversations, which is the, the program of action, the sort of recently passed resolution to establish uh, what would be kind of the first standing body that's going to be focused on cybersecurity uh, at the UN. And there's a lot of open questions about that, but I'd like to invert, invite uh, Bert and Charlotte back into the conversation um, to share a little bit about what that might look like and, and how that could regularize uh, perhaps more multi-stakeholder inclusion um, in, in the UN processes in the first committee. Um, yes, with pleasure. And again, as I said in the beginning, the discrepancy between the IGF and the General Assembly, we will not overcome this. There are many great initiatives out there. Uh, and again, we should also look more what the IGF experience, how this can, what that can bring, similar to the VCS forum, uh, and how the, et cetera. Uh, we have to see this, but also just to mention, uh, what's the best way forward? We have these limitations, and I must also say, I found it more frustrating in the open-ended working group, because there the no objection procedure that is now the practice for the invitation of uh, multi-stakeholder was used much more extensively uh, then in the ad hoc committee cybercrime process, where basically if you look at the list, it's a long, long list, more or less everyone who wanted to participate was able to participate, which is exactly how it should be. There are also other ways. I mean, uh, if you look in the, I, I have done many things. I was delegated to the CSW in the past. There you have a practice, many countries involve NGO representatives in government delegations. Now. This is something which was also done by some countries in the open ended working group after some with blocked organizations. I'm not totally sure that's the right message because I must say for me, multi-stakeholder or to put them in your delegation sounds like they're aligned with you. They have their own voice. I mean, I want you to be there whether you agree with me or not. That's the idea. I don't want them to be part of a government delegation. So I'm not absolutely sure that's the right way. I was often a delegate to the Human Rights Commission, uh, Commission. There, it depends a bit on the country, but in a number of negotiations on resolutions, um, non-state non participants are invited to participate in the negotiations as well. So that, there is precedent for almost everything. When it comes to the POA, I will now not go into the question how it should look like, etc. This is a separate discussion. Uh, it's an important project, and we're preparing another resolution for the General Assembly that, that, that is happening as we speak. 
I, uh, but again, the idea would indeed be to have more stability by having a permanent body, by having it inclusive. Uh, a strong focus of such a BOA should, of course, be on implementing the existing normative framework, including capacity building, where, of course, multi-stakeholder play a key role. They are major actors in this field, so therefore they also need to have a proper seat at the table. Um, and, but this we have to see, the BOA, we want this to be a UN body, so we still have, will have to fight that UN rules and regulations apply. So we have to see, we will have these difficult negotiations to have multi-stakeholders as prominently as possible at the table. Because as the saying goes, if you're not, if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu, so to say. Uh, so we really want multi-stakeholders to be at the table. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important to, to underline that the, the POA does present a sort of a unique opportunity to try to advance peace and security in cyber space by really focusing on the implementation of the agreed norms and ensuring practical and needs driven capacity building. Um, we do think that this, uh, this initiative needs to address a variety of issues related to the operationalization of the agreed upon framework. Um, that would benefit from real practical implementation and meaningful stakeholder, multi-stakeholder participation. Um, and that needs to therefore be reflected in the modalities. Um, so the modalities for stakeholder participation need to be very much clarified to make sure that the multi-stakeholder nature of cyberspace is reflected. Um, and the inclusion of all the relevant stakeholders in a dedicated forum would build legitimacy would shape any future instruments so this is this inclusiveness could create a process that really reflects the lived realities addresses real threats that affect the safety security and well-being of people um, and stakeholders can assist states to build their capacity and understanding of how to apply the norms so I think there's a real added role that um, civil society or other multi-stakeholder uh, organizations can play on a practical day-to-day -day level that if uh, we can contribute would be, um, would be invaluable. And I think civil society organizations are particularly well positioned to connect different actors and to build partnerships across a variety of communities and geographies um, and to help the practical implementation of the, of the cyber norms. And we can help um, in national and regional implementation efforts, including reporting on the progress. So that the real added value is there. And I think what is, is really, and I come back to this point I started with, the modalities, the POA modalities in relation to the scope, the method of establishment, the format, the frequency of meetings, the decision-making structures, and stakeholder participation, all of these points are being debated. And we urge that states really create a mechanism that reflects this multi-stakeholder nature. Um, and um, as some of the previous uh, participants mentioned, it does need to include civil society, industry, academia, the technical community, um, and the other experts who can really play um, a vital role and bring expertise to future dialogues on cybersecurity in the context of international security. And this will really drive much more impactful outcomes from the process and really contribute to ensuring transparency and credibility of the agreed decisions, as well as the sustainability of, of implementation. Thank you both so much. Um, points very well taken. Uh, I'm putting everybody on notice that we're going to have maybe one or two more questions here, um, and then I would love to hear from folks in the room. Again, either questions um, or, or comments on things that you think would be helpful at including more multi-stakeholder voices um, at, at, at the UN or elsewhere in conversations around peace and security online. Speaking of online, if you're part of the online audience, please do put questions in the chat, and um, my colleague Eduardo uh, will make sure that he addresses them uh, to, to, to the room. Um, but I want to pull over to sort of, I, I think what's been mentioned a couple times but underscores a lot of this, which is the geopolitics of the moment. Um, and so to maybe Joyce and then to, to Pablo to, um, to discuss, you know, rising tensions means that this is getting more difficult to have more inclusive, well, it seems to be more difficult to have any kind of productive conversation uh, in, in diplomatic spaces, uh, certainly multilateral ones, but, but in, in particular as it relates to multi-stakeholder inclusion, increasingly difficult to have multi-stakeholder voices heard. Um, Microsoft is certainly among uh, many, many other multi-stakeholder voices that would seem to be relevant to dialogues but have been blocked from participating by respective member states um, amid escalating geopolitical tensions. Um, how, how can we address this, uh, do you think, it, it, such that 
we can ensure that we have the necessary voices uh, and the inclusive dialogues we need uh, in, in future conversations without letting geopolitics play such a, a weighty role. And uh, just if you want to start. Thank you, thank you, John. I think this is a very important question. Like, how do we, you know, understand our reality and work within the confines of that? I think the maybe I sort of like split my answer into two kind of parts, or maybe to talk about it from sort of two different lenses. Um, so first of all, you know, there is. Um, there will be new processes, right? So we heard about the POA, uh, but outside of cyber, there are sort of like processes that are being established. And in cyber, there are calls for new processes, whether uh, leading to something binding or, or, or otherwise. Um, so I think it is very, very important, and it, at this point has been mentioned before, is that this starting point ought to be like, you know, figuring out good modalities for the process, right? So it's much harder when you have bad modalities to fight for multi-stakeholder participation, it's much Easier when it's already enshrined in the um, in the kind of the, in the in the in the process from the very beginning, and in that there has to be transparency. There has to be clear criteria for inclusion, but importantly, clear criteria for exclusion, right? And I think uh, we can perhaps also to aim to be a little bit more ambitious than just that, because even if you, you know, a certain member state can object and can say why it's objecting, and this won't sort of really kind of go f much further than that, I think maybe we should be more ambitious and ask for some, maybe some sort of formal procedure to resolve, resolve disputes when it comes to multi-stakeholder participation. I think we should, if we believe multi-stakeholderism is the, kind of way forward in digital technologies governance, which it should be, right? Uh, then we ought to have it like more sort of like part and parcel rather than something we sort of like every time try and beg for, right? It has to be there and has to be uh, unquestioned. Uh, but of course, this is a journey and you know, like bit by bit. And as you said, we've already had some successes and we hope to build on that. The other thing that I wanna, sort of the other lens is the how, how, how we sort of, um, what can we do with the existing processes and in the kind of the geopolitical context that, uh, that you described. I think an important point is that while it is very important to be in the room, and if you're not uh, on, the on the table, be on the menu, that's probably maybe true, but also I think uh, it is also important to know that the ability to influence is not just in the room. You know, there's a lot that can be done outside the room, and arguably, you can have a better impact you know, outside the room. When we take the floor in the open-ended working group, they give us three minutes to speak. You know, how, how much can you influence in three minutes? That's, uh, that's very, very arguable. So I guess this sort of like, you know, um, Combining this with other uh, initiatives outside of, of the UN processes is extremely important. And working on that sort of relationship with, with states uh, on a long-term uh, basis. I think the, um, we talked about that, the fact that some member states don't understand the value of multi-stakeholders. And I think there is an onus on multi-stakeholders to actually prove through actions what their value is, you know. Uh, Charlotte talked about data and research and the importance of that. Capacity building is absolutely important. And then through actions, member states can understand why multi-stakeholders are valuable and they will then become, you know, so the champions circle will expand beyond the, the, the current few. And I think also importantly is to focus on not just multilateral, we talk national, but also regional. And Pablo talked about, you know, OAS and the different kind of initiatives there, um, because that has also like a huge potential for influence. Um, if you can get ECOSOC st status, then do, because that will help you overcome a lot of challenges. And maybe kind of a final point, I think, you know, we are working on new areas, emerging areas, right? And I think we can't use sort of like always or just, um, you know, old or existing models to solve, you know, new and emerging problems. I think it's very important to be innovative, to be, you know, creative, think outside the box, particularly that, you know, we as multi-stakeholder community have limited resources. So yes, we might be able to participate in meetings if the door is open, but we might not, even if they let us, right? So I think there's also the, the need to think about how can we do it creatively and differently than the way we do it now. Well, I agree 100% with what we are saying, so I'm not quite sure that it adds something more valid. But uh, thinking about this, I think uh, um, while you mentioned modalities and also transparency and the, the regional aspect, let me come back again for the, uh, the strategy, you know, concept. I think uh, we definitely need more, this is the perspective of the government, to work more with state, state stakeholders, you know, in terms to how to face this problem. And how we can, I mean, create joint strategy for doing so, you know. I don't think there has too much dialogue from the 
uh, again, through the perspective of, of, of uh, my region, Latin America, that we really do uh, a lot in terms of every time we have a new meetings of the Open and the Working Group or Cybercrime, ADOC, to really have this chance to start or have this dialogue, you know, with stakeholders, you know. We are trying to move on in this uh, last year's with uh, was a Dutch initi initiatives when on in Chile that we managed to organize a dialogue with um, stakeholders and representatives from Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the region, which is really good to basically discuss, you know, open under working group, aid of comedy. But I think is uh, I think we'll, we definitely means trying to I mean to work more in a strategy to face this because the member state that, uh, that they are actually against participation with stakeholders they already have a strategy, you know. They have a goal, you know. That's the problem. You know? We are not facing something that they like it or not. They really have a very clear mission and goal to stop this. So I think we are not maybe have this sort of, uh, this is my impression at least, this sort of coordination to say, okay, they have a strategy, they want to do this. How we can actually create the counter narrative, you know, and do more than this. And I agree with also with yours very much mm -hmm. is, a lot of things we can do at the margins on all uh, these meetings, you know, especially at the regional level, at the OIS or in Africa, et cetera, which is probably has the most chances in the economy together, you know, and really thinks about things that are also are important to move on, as I mentioned, capacity building, implementations. Those are the things that in some region are really critical, really important, and we can have the chance in that case to work together, you know, at this at the space. That would be my beyond that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, you brought up a really good point at the end there that I, I want to circle back on at some point here, which is sort of what, what are the opportunities for engagement outside um, the, the UN and, and how can sort of cyber diplomats in that community uh, help to facilitate that and what can others from the non-governmental community do. But sort of before diving in there, I do want to invite, um, now that we're sort of in the latter half of the program, um, anyone in the room or online um, who has a question or a comment or other ways to contribute to this conversation and invite them to please take the floor. There are microphones in the aisles here um, and there is certainly the, the chat box online. And Eduardo, if you're able to come on, maybe you could uh, ask the, the first question if there is one. Sure, John. Um, maybe actually I'll pass uh, the floor over to Nick Ashton Hart who's had his hand up and I think wants to make a comment. Go for it, Nick. Uh, good good morning from from New York. Uh, it's like two thirty or something here. No, three. Sorry. Um, yeah, I wanted to follow up on the the point that Joyce made. I mean, I agree with everything everyone has said about the value of stakeholders and 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 what we bring to the table. I think we all know that's that's true. <clears throat> but I think we have to do something about it because you know, just like when women got the vote, they didn't get the vote because those who had the vote decided it would be a, it would be the right thing for them to get the vote. They got the vote because they went out and said, you're giving us the vote, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and made it unavoidable. And I, I, I follow a lot of processes at the UN. I'm, I'm, I, the cybersecurity process are frustrating because of this theater of the absurd of, of applying and then being vetoed. Um, the, the, the WTO negotiations on electronic commerce are completely closed to all stakeholders. It's, it's the least open uh, process. So believe it or not, it's actually somewhat better in the first committee. But I, I, I spend a lot of time with delegates in New York. I don't think, I think they're tired of having this stakeholder argument every time a new first committee process is launched. I know they're tired of it. I think a majority of states think it's a, lo a lot of wasted time goes on arguing about this. It's the same argument every time. Um, and I, I do believe that there is appetite to make a, a set policy on stakeholders that would turn it into more of an administrative process that, that happens each time a first committee process is convened, especially related to the internet. Um, and, and then that would be the end of it. This, this, the decision would be taken we would be able to, to participate and uh, that would be that. States would still take decisions and we would speak lost and, and all the rest of it, but we would have something more like what we have at the Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime where, where you know, it's, it's an administrative process really. It's not a political process, which is what of course it's being turned into. And I, and I think as stakeholders, if that's something we believe we want, we're going to have to advocate for it. We're gonna to have to 
do the legwork on the ground with the with the delegates, get someone to propose a general assembly resolution. And and I think we would win. I think we would win on votes if there's voting. I, it wouldn't be consensus, of course, because the, the states that don't want us don't want us. And that's the way it is. Uh, I, I think we would have a clear majority in favor of, a, of an administrative process just because um, what we, 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 it, we're right, basically. <laughs> we're right, but also even for the states who are somewhat, who are, who are don't, don't care that much one way or the other, they're tired of fighting about it and wasting a great deal of time uh, arguing over the subject. Um, so I, I think it would be interesting to, to if, if any of the rest of you have thoughts on that, it would be interesting to actually mount a campaign to solve this problem on a, on a, on a horizontal basis, once and for all. Um, because I think that's the only real way we're going to get a solution. And the honest truth is the states would be far, far better off if we were around to bug them because they need a more ambitious agenda when it comes to cybersecurity, really. I mean, if you look at, at what's on the table to be decided at the OEWG, and you look at what's going on in international cybersecurity, there is a huge gap in, in need versus what's actually being addressed. Well Thanks. taken, Nick, and thank you so much. Um, well, I'll, I will leave it to the panel on the table to see if there's anyone that would like to take up that thought about moving this to a, an administrative matter as opposed to a political process, um, and, and whether or not uh, Nick's read of the appetite uh, is, has some accuracy and, and validity to it. I would be happy to try to answer, to, uh, to, to try to respond to Nick's question. It's a good point. You're right that people are very tired of this question because it comes up, up again and again. Um, and it's particularly because it have, has become such a politicized question. Um, and it has been politicized by a number of uh, countries and it will be difficult all along. I think the idea whether a once, one size fits all forever resolution of the General Assembly, how many stakeholders should participate in such processes, is, a, it is, a, is an interesting idea. One has to, it has to be discussed. I see a number of drawbacks, namely it's so difficult if you, if you open, make this totally unclear for what type of future process. I'm not sure we get the best result. We might get better results on the specific process, on the specific circumstances, than when it's for any future process where it might become quite narrow and it might be a difficult process. But it's like something to be discussed. My concern is even if we, if we would succeed, if then a new process would be set up, we would then again have a, have a fight whether the agreed framework is being applied or whether specific rules have to be decided upon. So we might go, come back to square one. But we certainly, it's an urgent matter. And the issue where I think which is particularly urgent is uh, we are discussing here a lot, both in sessions and informally, um, about the upcoming process of negotiating, particularly the Global Digital Compact, which is part of a much broader process uh, preparing for the summit for the future, where we need strongest possible multi-stakeholder involvement in the General Assembly process, which is sort of, as, a, as I said already, intergovernmental by nature where we have the challenge that basically our key objective is uh, out of this process a reaffirmation of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, also, in our view, a strong role for the IGF. But then, uh, again, to get there, the process must be as multi-stakeholder oriented as possible. And this will, again, be an uphill battle. It's even not clear whether the multi-stakeholder arrangement would be made specifically for the Global Digital Compact negotiations or for the entire process. I would be in favor of doing it specifically for the Global Digital Compact because there's a better understanding of their role than, for instance, when you negotiate a new agenda for peace, where basically I think uh, there's a sense that states have a much stronger role to play. But it's also, I think we need to see, I mean, where are countries who, are, I mean, there are some countries who are very critical, they're opposed to multi-stakeholder involvement for a number of reasons. We also need to um, do more work why it is of benefit to all of us. It has become a political issue. For me, it's an issue of expertise, of quality control. I can only say I come from a country, our, our capacity in the area of cyber, digital, et cetera, is limited. We benefit a lot from talking to 
uh, industry partners, from academics, experts, etc. Without them, we can't survive these such negotiations. This is from where we get ideas, inputs, which, uh, a quality check of our ideas. And I'm sure it's the same for others. And it's also therefore important that multi stakeholder involvement is as inclusive as possible and as representative, because there's also a sense multi stakeholder means basically big tech companies sitting at the table. It must be clear that this must be broad, and every effort must be made that it's as inclusive as possible. Thank you. And maybe if I can add, uh, I agree with everything you said, Bert, and I agree with the sentiment behind Nick's message that we need more passion to kind of like, you know, have this, uh, you know, this, this, this issue resolved and we need to be a little bit more uh, strategic and have uh, more ambitious plans. But on your point, Bert, about how you benefit from multi-stakeholders' uh, input, I think it also goes both ways because we benefit also when we speak with governments about what you know what's on their mind, how they're thinking about um, you know the sort of different priorities. Um, sometimes you know we even if we follow online, if we're in the room, we might not know the kind of what's really going on. So speaking to them is also very valuable to us because it makes our role much better, right? If we kind of like have our fingers on the on the right pulse. So. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. Thank you again to Nick um, for, you know, even if we don't have something that's going to be uh, the, the be all end all, I think even moving towards what is a gold standard of multi-stakeholder inclusion, uh, what in the US we call it the, the Cadillac of multi-stakeholder inclusion, but noticing that we're in Japan, maybe it's the Lexus of multi-stakeholder inclusion, um, I think could be a good framework to, to work towards. I think we have a question in the room here. Thank you very much, our speakers, for such an interesting uh, conversation and uh, discussion. I think I'm just going to point out the elephant in the room. We are talking about multi-stakeholderism and just looking, I was just looking at the representation of different multi-stakeholders from the panel and I don't see representation from African stakeholders. So I guess my question would be how involved are African stakeholders in these discussions and debates and what can they do to improve uh, their participatory role in these discussions. So I understand maybe government actors, there could be different processes being followed, but with the private sector, academia, civil society, what exactly is being done to increase or to improve their participation in discussions like this? And just giving this as an example, like we talk about inclusion, uh, but if we are not going to have African voices being part of these uh, uh, discussions, uh, it becomes a bit difficult to understand how we approach our multi-stakeholderism. Thank you. Absolutely, um, and thank you so much for the question, and I, I will leave it to those on the table to comment on um, multi-stakeholder inclusion and participation in the dialogues from across uh, you know, geographic regions and, and lines of difference. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, and happy to take a stab. I think you're absolutely right. I think we talk about multi-stakeholder participation, but if we look at the composition of the multi-stakeholder groups, it tends to be more sort of Western-dominated. So you're absolutely right that there's a need for inclusion that goes and also like at the, at the regional level and not just bring different actors, but also actors who represent different regions. And that's why I talked about the importance of regional efforts, that we don't put all our focus just on UN processes, because there's a lot going on at region level, at national level, and the experience from those stakeholders who are very much uh, on the field would be absolutely uh, very, very valuable to the UN processes and, and beyond. So I think, um, you know, definitely agree with you there. And, you know, I think also we need to be um, honest about how multi-stakeholders coordinate with each other. And I don't think it's, 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 it's great either. I think there is definitely room to improve. But, but as I said, um, it's a learning curve on several different fronts. The focus for today is how we work better with governments, but also there is a bigger question around how we work better with each other and how we bring more voices into the debate. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, I think, indeed, there is a lot that, that still can be done, but it's also a capacity issue, I think. And coming from a developing country, I think it's even more difficult to dedicate some time to come to New York and to come to those processes. And I think that's why also the initiative at national, regional level are so important. And it was mentioned earlier, it's not only about what you're saying in the room, it's actually the ongoing discussion that you have with your representative that will go to New York and will represent those points. And having those long run discussion, not only a one go uh, in, in this, in, during the open-ended working group, but really like an ongoing uh, discussion where you actually bring to your governments, to your people that will represent 
be present in the room negotiating, you give them the arguments that they will need to shape an informed policy that will benefit also not only us, but like everyone, every stakeholder groups. And that's completely part of, of, of the entire process. So we have the luxury that we, we, we can do it. We also have a, a, a some uh, diplomats that are there on, in different countries that can also have those discussions, not only with our national stakeholders, but also with other stakeholders, stake, stakeholders from other regions. But really, like, we need those information to take informed policy decision that we will then bring to those, to those, to those fora. And uh, thank you, Nick, for being a very dedicated stakeholder, being still up at 3 a.m. <laughs> for this discussion. But uh, that's exactly the kind of stakeholders that we need, like really dedicated as well. And we understand that it, it's, it's a capacity issue as well. So wherever you can go at, the, at any level, try to like bring your expertise and knowledge so we can take better informed policy dec decisions. I believe Bert and Charlotte online also asked for the floor, so. Okay, very briefly, sorry. Uh, I think a very important point, um, just two comments. Um, one is, I also, it's the same challenge also on the government side, huh? how to ensure to have negotiations that are inclusive. What I notice, for instance, if you compare the open-ended working group with the ad hoc committee negotiations, through a number of measures, including that some funding is available for travel, far more countries are represented by experts from capital in the cybercrime negotiations than in the open-ended working group. And it, you see that the, 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 the quality of the discussion is quite different in a way. I mean, it's, I find it, I learn a lot from listening to, to the different perspectives, and that's extremely positive. The same applies for, multi, for on the multi-stakeholder side. Some initiatives have been taken to facilitate, to provide funding, to participate in such meetings, etc. but of course, we all agree, even for us, I mean, we often, we sometimes get denied the, uh, the, the funding for travel to New York because it's too expensive to spend two weeks in New York or so, and I'm sure it's even worse for multi-stakeholders. And so we have to see what more is possible there to allow participation, because if you have seen it once, then you also understand better how it works. And then that's maybe the advantage, that's also one of the positive side effects of COVID. There's a sort of a democratization of such multilateral processes. All of this is now hybrid, all of this is screened, and you can participate much more easily. And again, a key role is any government in New York the position formulated is back in capital. So you have to, you need to work with the people in capital so that the people who sit in New York, Geneva or wherever, they press the right button or make the right statement. So a lot of the work has to happen at national level in any event. Thank you. Thank you, and Charlotte, if you're gonna take the floor, please do. Yes, just very quickly, and I think it's a really important point, particularly about African uh, representation. Uh, it's something that we tested also uh, a year and a half ago, where we invited ambassadors uh, from representatives of the African Union in Geneva to come for a half-day workshop on, um, on all of these processes. There was definitely an appetite. There were representation from most countries of the African Union at ambassador level. So there's definitely an appetite to um, engage and to learn more about these processes. And I think it's also really important to demystify these processes because we, uh, we heard feedback, for example, that, oh, well, you know, we specialize more on human rights. Well, actually, a lot of what's been discussing at the open-ended working group is about human rights. And so that there are very transferable skills. It's just sometimes the language is very exclusive or very difficult um, for people to feel that, oh, well, I haven't followed these debates for many years, therefore I, don't, I can't contribute. And actually what we saw was that there were very key um, messages and participation possibilities from the representatives of the African Union that could very easily transfer their skill set into these negotiations. So I think there's an appetite. Uh, we just need to focus much more on the capacity building side. Thank you all. Um, I think we have two questions I saw in the room. Patrick, were you at the mic a moment ago? And then the young woman over here. And then uh, I, back over to you, Eduardo, if there's anyone online after that. Uh, hi, I'm Patrick Pavlak from Carnegie Europe. Um, my question was partly asked and partly answered. So uh, let me use the microphone to push back a bit and. Uh, get a bit more precise answers. Um, in answering to the colleague's question, many of you said, yes, the engagement with stakeholders at the national and regional level is important and we have to do it more. How exactly do you envisage this? We have three governments on the podium. 
Could you describe to us how each of your governments engages with your civil society ahead of the open-ended working groups? You know, I know for the fact that actually we very often talk about this engagement of multi-stakeholder community. It happens through the side events during the open-ended working group sessions or uh, any other events there. And very often the, uh, those meetings are really used as a fig leaf, let's say, for the lack of engagement of the national level. So if you could share some concrete examples, that would be great. Speaking about national engagement at the, at the, uh, with civil society, a lot of organizations from many countries around the world will tell you that actually they have no access. It will be easier for Joyce from Chatham House to talk to anybody in the world, to cyber ambassadors and get the access, that for the regional civil society organizations who are completely ignored, right? So how do we break uh, that sort of a ceiling at the, um, uh, at the national level? And thirdly, I think that this engagement at the national and regional level indeed might be a more sustainable solution if we really want to create, let's say, better functioning uh, cyber diplomacy engagement, simply because so many countries in the world actually have the shrinking space for civil society organizations. So by creating the opportunities for engagement around cyber issues, we're also contributing to strengthening the broader ecosystem of civil society organizations. So, Yes, uh, I agree, but I wonder how you think we could do this in a more specific way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And it, it maybe a question over here as well, and we'll just sort of take both together. Thank you very much. I'm Larissa Causa, Head of Cybersecurity at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. I would like to first of all thank all the panelists for their interventions. And I would have one question building up on a point that I believe Charlotte made about fragmentation of the debate on cybersecurity and how, it was, how detrimental it was in the period from 2019 to 2021 to the participation of non-government stakeholders. Well, for Brazil, fragmentation is a huge concern. It, it is a challenge not only to non-state stakeholders, but also to most developing countries. Uh, it's always difficult to have enough delegates to follow multiple tracks uh, at the UN. And so one question I would have is, well, uh, we've spoken a lot about the POA and in very supportive terms, and Brazil very much supports continuing discussions uh, on the proposal, but it is not uh, a consensus within the UN. Uh, we, ha we have observed recently a fragmentation on states that support a POA, states that still uh, are very much in favor of starting negotiations on a legally binding instrument, which us nationally feel uh, that it is not quite a moment for it yet, though we do not oppose the idea of something legally binding. But our con So I guess my question would be, do you, view, do you see a risk of having this fragmentation once again, given uh, the polarization of positions on the future of the institutional dialogue after the OEWG. And second, if the POA is indeed adopted uh, this year, how do we avoid uh, that, that the OEWG in a way is undermined or has its discuss discussions emptied due to a decision being made two years ahead of the end of its mandate on regular institutional dialogue? Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. Um, I will leave it to you to sort of take the questions um, in, in turn or, or in the order that you'd like. Um, anyone on the stage would like to, to hop in? Or of course, Charlotte online. So I can't, I can't answer the question what governments are doing to engage the society. I know my government doesn't do anything, so yeah, how they should do it. Um, I suppose, but I can, I can sort of like, because this is of course like a very important problem and we, we think about it as well because inclusive governance is one of the sort of strategic priorities for our work at Chatham House. Um, and you know, and just someone talked about the appetite that exists and I agree with that. I think there's a huge appetite. We organized, I think it was last year, a conference in Jordan um, about, and we have a representative from the MFA here, about the um, cyber diplomacy in the Arab region and what are their perspectives. And 
I was amazed by the turnout, by the how much you know, eagerness there was from not just governments, but also non-state stakeholders to be part of this conversation. But there is, of course, like an issue of um, you know, sort of subject matter expertise with these UN processes. And as Charlotte mentioned, it can be a little bit uh, too intimidating because if you're not, I mean, even for us, if I miss one OEWG session, I'm like, I don't know what's happening anymore, you know? It's very hard to kind of stay on top of these very lengthy negotiation process and be, and feel like you have the expertise to contribute every time in an informed way. And so I guess there is sort of responsibility on both sides. If we look at the um, list of accredited organizations to the Cybercrime Convention, which as uh, Bert mentioned, they were all accredited after maybe a little bit of a of pushback. Um, I think there were around 160, something like that. But if you look at how many organizations actually participate, I think maybe 20, something, or maybe a little bit more in terms of consistently participating, and although there is the opportunity for online engagement, et cetera. So there is also this, if you want to engage, you need to put in the effort, and that's, that's very true. But there is maybe perhaps, how do we encourage that? I think, you know, maybe sort of the governments, that, the way they have been supporting developing states to come to the negotiations, perhaps there could be some funding dedicated to bring in multi-stakeholders more into the debate. And I know, Patrick, you've done uh, uh, work on that in, in, the, in, the, in the past, and I think more initiatives Initiatives like this would be extremely important. Oh. On the uh, fragmentation uh, point uh, that was mentioned, I think the I think the question was, uh, should we be concerned about fragmentation with uh, you know new processes? I think, to be honest, I think the fragmentation is already here to a certain extent. I mean, because we engage in the open-ended working group and the cybercrime process, you feel that. Um, there is, you know, this huge desire to keep those different conversations separate. And of course, you know, this, is, this one is dealing with international peace and security. This one is dealing with criminal activities. But the reality of cyberspace is that the lines are not, you know, sort of like that this division is not very clear. It's, sometimes it's artificial and the distinction is not as clear cut. So there are overlaps that need to be understood. If we take, for example, as you, as you probably know now, the open-ended working group is trying to operationalize this point of contact directory about, you know, each state will have one uh, uh, organization dedicated to sort of answer uh, uh, responses and requests to de-escalate. There is a similar um, obligation almost or like expectation in the cybercrime convention about 24-7 networks and having a point of contact, etc. I mean, of course, they will have different mandates, but as we know, in a lot of states, like there will be one agency doing different, like the same role, right? Doing sort of cybersecurity stuff, but also cybercrime stuff. So we need to be more conscious in terms of where do these, where the touch points are, how do we understand them, and how do we reflect them better in policies? And I think here really, like multi-stakeholders can play a very big role, right? In bringing those sort of nuances together yeah. and in kind of like talking about them in a, in a more sort of clear way. So that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me start with a question with, from uh, Larissa. Uh, it is a very good question, by the way, because we have this uh, internal discussions, you know, in our Minister of Foreign Affairs and also in our conversation between Latin American state, Brazil, Argentina, et cetera, about the, uh, this situation we are right now, as mentioned before, about this geopolitical context, which is quite difficult. And the problem is not just in the open under working group, also in the cyber crime, if you go to the discussion of autonomous weapon system, we're we gonna, uh, it seems that we have this sort of fracture, you know, that is already there. So what we can do, basically, I mean, what we can really, I mean, one of the reasons we, uh, regarding the POA, why we supported, I mean, the pay from the, uh, not the very beginning, but from the uh, 2021, was because it was action-oriented. So it was something say, okay, we have this discussion you had, which is, well, by the way, Chile voted against the Open Ended Working Group back uh, in 2019, uh, um, and the same for the uh, for, for the uh, other committee. Um, I can explain. I can explain why. But uh, uh, at that moment, we say, okay, this is a good uh, idea because it's something that basically we definitely need from the perspective of our country, Latin American, action oriented. You know, focus on capacity building, implementation. We can keep the discussion, I mean, about international law application, et cetera, but we have very critical needs that we need to in some way achieve. So uh, that's the reason why we vote against this. You know, we support it, I mean, the POA. But uh, you're right that we have this sort of things, what we can do now, that we have the Open Ended Working Group, 
the POA, the POS part of course the discussion, the weapon open away group, the regional di uh, institutional dialogue, you know. And uh, I'm not quite sure that I have the right answer, you know. And uh, in a way I think of, um, it's also I mean, connected what's going on today, I mean worldwide, you know. Um, this situation is going to have been stayed, I mean, for a long term, uh, or we can have just a point that we can actually create or establish some concern. The discussion is quite frustrated, by the way. Uh, the cyber crime is sometimes even impossible, you know, to agree in, you know, some technicals, I mean, on the practical solution because we have this, you know, this problem, you know, and. And it's not so simple because some states have their own view, principles, and values. And other states are avoided with different ones. So it's a cultural problem, geopolitical problems. Maybe in the next future we will have different internets. I don't know. But uh, I agree with those. And this factor is already, yeah, I mean, the way I can manage this is going to be something that definitely we will need to discuss more and see what can we remove on. But I agree with you that it's something that uh, several states have a lot of concern about how to deal with the process. So it's not a just, it's a very important matter. I mean, part of the, our I mean, discussions. Uh, regarding Patrick's questions, always very good questions, very fundamental questions. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I have to confess to you, Patrick, that, uh, um, you know, sometimes we are, I see a lot of states regarding multi state holding our statement, you know, we're very clear that we support multi state holder and engagement and so on. And at the very end, you come back to capital and realize that probably you're not do it, I mean, uh, enough, you know, to work with them. That is true. I have to confess. In my case, when I started cybersecurity in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 10 years ago, I had no idea about the state holding. It was, I think, it was Microsoft the first time. Kaja Siklic in Singapore that taught me that Microsoft has this cyber diplomacy approach. I just came back to our Minister of Foreign Affairs to explain to my bosses, you know, ambassadors about the uh, role of Microsoft in international security. It's trying to make understand to them. So that's been quite fascinating. I mean, my background is non-proliferation, arms control. You don't see that, you know, in other processes. Sometimes, you know, in, and I can tell from, from, from our reality, or maybe also Latin America, is a lack, you know, of, of people, you know, and you still don't have too much, you know, uh, expert on your now means to phone a first, you have the capacity, you know, to cover one thing or another. You, you know, my case, I have to cover cyber security, cyber crime, and many other things. So we will have to have more time, you know, to engage you now on what I, I would like to do more with stakeholders is to work in some specific line of actions. You know. Again, maybe of a strategy, you know. If it comes to international law, I mean Chatham House maybe, you know have some idea to do something, I mean, next year in Chile, you know. When it comes to CBS, or we can, I don't know, with the implementation IHL, which is a, something very important, and Switzerland has been one of the champions on this, you know, how we can actually work with some specific states, they hold the thing in, in, in our regions. It's something that can be done. It's sometimes a lack of time, the lack of resources, you know, so many things to do back in capital, but, uh, I will give you again, I mean, this something that we did with Netherlands, you know, but it's this dialogue, you know. I don't think we have too much dialogue in our regions, you know, when we can, and for that um, dialogue, something that we uh, agree with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs was to invite representative the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. not just people from Ministry of Interior or CSERS, you know, to bring them in, the people in charge of cybersecurity, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to talk and engage with multi stakeholders, you know, and talk about, you know, processes we have, you know, at the UN level, you know. And, and I would add just to, and I have to think of, keep in mind that the important roles that regional organizations can play on this. And most of engagement of stakeholders, be thanks to the OIS, and I think in other regions, it's the same. Chile is now the chair of the CICTA, you know, the Inter-American Comedy Against Terrorism, when the cybersecurity program is placed there. So it's something with, and especially on the implementation of CBM, it's something that we definitely need to, uh, would like to do more and engage this stakeholder more in this process. But uh, I totally agree with you that it's not maybe good enough we're doing right now. Thank you. I just want to yeah. Um, I couldn't be a better advocate for our way of uh, doing stakeholder engagement than, uh, than you are. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll give you a bit of like my background and how it was when uh, I started that working uh, on cyber issue in, in the Netherlands. That, that was a few years back. 
Um, so at national level, it was back in the preparation of the GGE and the Open Ended Working Group in 2019. And back then, I went back to The Hague from Geneva, and we were having actually a consultation with other stakeholders to actually, before we entered into those rooms, uh, more or less open, um, then we would be able to have an informed policy position. And um, I'm not saying we do, we're doing it enough, and I think that's one thing, probably not enough, but we are, we are already trying at that level. The other thing that we are doing is, obviously, those conferences, I think uh, Bert pointed out quite well that the IGF is, is a place also where we can have lots of open discussion. And we should also grab those opportunities that we have at the IGF, at our national uh, I, I, IGF, uh, IGF at also the regional IGF to also talk about those issues that we are facing in the first committee and then grab all the expertise that is there because there are so many people around here they know so much more than we would then we really need to grab those opportunities I'm talking about the IGF but I can also talk about non-UN uh, uh, forum like RightsCon or the GFC uh, uh, um, conference in Accra next month, for example. I think we need to take all those opportunities to really also ourselves engage with the, with the stakeholder uh, community as well. Um, I mean, uh, capacity building, we are doing lots of capacity building and we're also trying to uh, bring this knowledge about like what the first committee is about, what we're discussing, what is the normative framework, what are our objective and really like looking into the implementation and what it means also for, for people. So then when they are informed, they can also engage. Uh, so Charlotte, as you said, like we need to also demystify what's happening in the first committee. And I think that's on our side also an effort that we need to do uh, because it's already complex for us to understand how those um, processes work. So for someone who doesn't have, have been there for so long or is not engaged uh, uh, in every day or in all the discussion or can it be engaged in all the discussion, it's even more complicated. So I think on our side, we also need to do more on demystifying uh, those processes and explaining uh, what you can bring to, uh, to those, to those discussions. Um, I have to say, I, we have the luxury of, of having a, a nice uh, cyber uh, uh, policy and, and, and we have uh, 34 now cyber diplomats around the world, so we also participate in, in regional meetings and so on and so forth. And we try to grab all of this, but we also try to share our knowledge and our experience to make everyone like, be able to also engage and we st still have so much to learn, and I'm sure some others have better ways of doing, but I think it's about exchanging on how we do and then learning from others on what they have been doing. And then we can just like improve the way we engage, but it's true that we have the luxury of having a bit more people. Uh, so I can, uh, happy to share, but also really happy to get some feedbacks on how you would like us to engage with you, uh, because that's the only way we can make it better, so. Thanks so much. Also, as I mentioned already, for us it's important we learn a lot from others, um, both governments, other multi-stakeholders. It's of critical importance. Joyce, you said that many, many multi-stakeholders were accredited to the ad hoc committee, but not so many make use of it. And that's, of course, a challenge. And, of course, even for governments, I mean, these cybercrime negotiations, this is this year, three times, two weeks. Uh, it's a huge investment. It's difficult to take, and there, indeed, if you're not following it closely, it's difficult to do so. Uh, so it's, that's a challenge uh, in terms also of resources. And by the way, if I may go, may go back one, for one second to the Global Digital Compact, which is coming up. Also there, I hope that many multi-stakeholders will take the, make the investment, because it's important that uh, one does. Uh, I, had to, I was a bit concerned that everyone was invited to provide input and so on uh, already late last year until I think April, March or April this year. Uh, and then I think nobody ever heard what happened to the input. Uh, and then we had the policy briefs, which I can't imagine would really somehow be a reflection of the input received. So I, heard, I hear also here when I talk to people about, them, uh, about that process, there's, this, there's a lot of, uh, there's some who say, well, it's, is it really worthwhile to invest? It's so difficult anyway, there's such limited access, and so far our input has not been appreciated. 
that's a huge concern to me because we need multi-stakeholder involvement in the process in order to get the reaffirmation of the multi-stakeholder model as an outcome. So that's certainly an issue. Responding to the question of Patrick, uh, how do we involve multi-stakeholders? And maybe I start then with the Global Digital Compact. There, basically, we use the national IGF um, to both to discuss the whole process, but also to prepare input. So we had the, both a government input and a multi-stakeholder input, where we used the national sort of IGF for it. When it comes uh, to the ad hoc committee, uh, there we use very much uh, our public-private partnership with the whole industry. It's called the cybersecurity platform, where we basically bring all the people together. For instance, telecom, etc. They're hugely interested. What sort of what, how this treaty uh, turns out because it has serious implications for them. Uh, so they are, some of them are also actively participating, but we regularly try to exchange with them. Um, and I must say this, the weakest involvement we have on the open-ended working group, simply because unfortunately we're a relatively small country, the interest is so far limited because most people are not really, doesn't, for them it doesn't, it's not clear what's in it for them. Uh, so there we need to mobilize interest um, so that they're fully aware of it. But we, as I mentioned, we're working on a national position paper on international law. There we're now finalizing our government draft, and this one we want to consult with multi-stakeholder, particularly, of course, with the international law community, so to say. And then uh, I think Pablo responded already a little bit to our colleague from Brazil on her important question of how do we go ahead uh, in the first committee with the idea of the POA. I mean, this proposal has been now around for a couple of years. Uh, it has also, also a lot of support, and I also think the uh, concrete ideas that it makes a difference uh, uh, in terms of implementation, etc. The idea with the POA is exactly to avoid fragmentation and to avoid battles every two, three years over new mandates, um, and to have sort of a permanent body which deals with issues, which also, by the way, would permanently settle the question of multi-stakeholder involvement, hopefully, <laughs> at least for that process. Um, and, but again, also there, the idea certainly would be that we use the current open-ended working group to, dis to use to discuss in detail how this should be, fi be f uh, uh, figured out, what the elements should be, and then any sort of configuration would be the follow-up to the open-ended working group. But we will have to see how it bends out. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, negotiations on this are ongoing, but we very much hope that in the end we have an inclusive uh, process and we end up with one mechanism after the open ended working group because also more we, as we discussed for any one of us is difficult um, to entertain thank you so much thank you thank you all um, for this we're coming up on time here so I'm just gonna say uh, Eduardo is there a question um, online otherwise I think we've uh, exhausted things in the room and I'll move to just a final quick lightning round question um, we we do have a question. I wonder if we have time to answer it. But um, Amir Mokaberi was questioning the legitimacy of um, companies participating um, in uh, multi-stakeholder discussions, um, especially in the field of international law development and norm making, due to their democratic nature, conflict of interest, and lack of election uh, by citizens. So I wonder if you have a quick response to that, um, John. Yeah, maybe I take that one. Um. <laughs> Uh, no, I think I think it's a fair question and a fair thing to be you know concerned about in terms of what is the the, the proper uh, scope and and size of uh, private industry engagement in any uh, conversations that relates to, to governance, whether at a, at a national level or international level. Um, the, the, you know, the only thing I'll say is, is you know, Microsoft makes pro products and services that we we sell uh, and that help to augment the, the digital domain, and we certainly don't want to be uh, contributing to a space that is getting increasingly unsafe and more unstable. And so supporting these dialogues is critically important to, to us as an organization that is, um, that is a large technology company. Um, but I, I think we are always clear in that, and we would want to always be as, as, um, as transparent in this as, pro as possible in saying that, that obviously governments make the decisions here. We don't. Uh, we, we are, you know, I think together with our other multi-stakeholder partners pushing for a voice at the table, not a vote. Um, and that seems to be always the, the proper uh, boundary and limitation there. So um, I hope that answers that question well enough. Um, and I will just say in the last couple minutes, uh, a lightning round. If there are sort of non-governmental stakeholders in the room uh, I, who have not engaged before in any of these processes at the, at the UN, um, what would be just a quick piece of guidance on the way they could be most impactful in helping to uh, support government dialogues on cybersecurity at the UN? Anyone can start. I'll start, because I'm at the back of the table. 
Um, I'll be short because we don't have so much time, but I would say, um, so approach us. We're not, we, we will listen and, uh, and um, be there, provide information, numbers, facts, show the impacts of the project that you're doing like in the different countries, in the different regions, report on what's happening. Um, those information can only give us like, give an added value to, to, to the discussion that will happen in the context of the, the, of the UN. But also, if you start following it from a, like, it's not a one go. If you start following it, then come back to us and tell us, oh, you did this, but you haven't yet talked about that or this. And actually, I have to say, I find it like very sad that people are saying that they don't see the impact of what they, they bring to the table. But I can say that for some of the outcome from the open-ended working group and GGE report in 2021, there are actually things there that I heard happening at the beginning of the process when it was inside event in discussion that we had with civil society, the private sector, academia, and actually they made their way through the end report. So actually it, it's a long process. It, it's frustrating because it takes time and you don't always have everything you would like to see, but they, it made its way through. So it just like continue and, um, and hold us accountable for making sure that we are taking the right uh, uh, position when it comes to those discussions. Yeah, I, I would agree on, on, on what Marie said. And also, I mean, I encourage you know, to approach the states, you know, in just our conversation in New York, in Vienna, and other places, but also in capital, you know. Uh, most of our work that we did with um, stakeholders is because they approached to us, you know, pro proposing, you know, side events. We did one very good in July. Uh, regarding the uh, toolkits for implementation of norms for marginalized stakeholders. That was very interesting with other states, I mean, Mexico and Colombia. And most of this relation has been because thanks to this stakeholder approach to us, you know, to propose ideas, to uh, make this exchange of view about what thinking about their, I don't know, the next POA or open the working group or cybercrime conversations. So I encourage you know, to take on the winner state. You know, of course, during this, uh, uh, our meetings in New York and Vienna, we had the chance to create a sort of, I would say even friendship, you know. That's one of, one of the things I really like about Stay Home, you know. You share beer, go dancing, whatever. And then, I mean, <laughs> just come back, you know, and say, hey, let's go uh, on, uh, to work on something or just have, you know, some meetings. And we were having this uh, conversation very much with, for example, Microsoft, with cyber crimes. I always really like, of course, also the submission of documents. Probably we never really, I mean, uh, thanks, I mean, the, um, the uh, stakeholder that has these really good documents. Sometimes even in our standing, be using some very good ideas in the office and there. I mean, it's never really, I mean, recognizes, I mean, incredible, uh, work, very good documents and they're putting there just for both, I mean, conversations. So thank you for that. Great. And we are one minute over, so 20 seconds for everybody else. Oh, yeah. No, please. Okay, 20 seconds. Um, I think maybe choose one thing that you think you can contribute value and not try to do everything if you're new to this, right? Uh, if, you w if I want to look at the OEWG, uh, in July they agreed on an annual progress report with a, like a whole loads of recommendations, very concrete actions, right? If you're you know, a CSO, like an industry, whatever, you want to be involved, look at those recommendations and see, can I contribute to one or more? from my perspective, whether it's national or regional, and maybe sort of take that as your first step and gradually, you know, you'll feel that you are being more involved than as Marie mentioned, like, you know, states are reading, are listening, so your input will make a difference. I would fully subscribe to that. Um, build also partnerships with others. And then, I, again, what I also often notice is we, we receive a lot of proposals, ideas, sometimes very general, sometimes very specific, and very often it happens that you pick certain elements up in a statement, in negotiations, as an argument, etc. But rarely you write back to the organizations, thank you, I use this here or there. So therefore, I, I thought I want to get better with this because it's difficult sometimes to measure impact and often you might not hear about it and you might have no idea how it might was used and you might have more impact than you think that you have. Thank you. Thank you, and Charlotte, if you're online, for the last word for 20 seconds. Yes, I am. I would just say very quickly, uh, in terms of engagement, I think what is critical is fact-based, 
framing and the timing of the input, particularly for states, so that they can then take that input and engage. So even if you can't speak at the table, that you can produce that input, but you have to do it in a timely way. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all so much for, for showing up, especially late in the day here. Uh, to everybody online, especially folks like Nick, who are up at 3 in the morning, really appreciate the engagement um, and look forward to seeing you all uh, throughout the week here at IGF. And thank you to our panel. And please join me in giving them a big round of applause.